I'd like to welcome you to our third annual SEND Symposium. Um, this is our, one of our keynote, if not the keynote event for the year. For those of you who aren't familiar with SEND, this is the Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. Oh, I'm not Dr. Gerberding. I wish I was. Okay. Um, this is a group of investigators, really over the Bay Area, but at Berkeley, that re represents individuals from all over campus, be it biology, engineering, bio uh, chemistry, even the law school, with kind of a common interest in global health. Now, this has been going on for, I'm not sure the number of years, Jeff, maybe it's five or so years, probably more. Jeff Owen, the former dean of biology, had the vision to start this as he recognized that Berkeley was the perfect place to start bringing together all of these people who are working on dis disparate areas, but were starting to appreciate that their expertise could be used to make the world a better place. And after Jeff is now still involved, and then we acknowledge that, and Mark Schlissel is now the next dean, and he's supporting this as well. But none of this could have really gotten off the ground without a founding gift, a very generous gift from Sam Wheeler, who is here and has been here for all of these symposia. And we established, with this gift, a 20-year endowment. So we're not going away. OK. Anyway, this group is gathering so much momentum over the last couple of years, and this year has been the best year of all. And I want to acknowledge that the faculty director of SEND is Tom Alber, and he works very closely with the executive director, Tamina Madden, who together have worked tirelessly and really importantly, passionately to get this off the ground. And what I think Tom, more as much as anyone, typifies what we've seen at Berkeley. Tom. I don't, trained in chemistry and biochemistry and biophysics and worked on very basic problems for years. And then he really redirected his research and started working on mycobacterium tuberculosis and HIV and started really thinking about how he could use his expertise to affect the developing world. And Tom has established, and Tamina and others have established consortium with universities and institutes in India and South Africa. And in fact, I have a whole list of countries, um, but I'm too vain to put my glasses on, so we'll just have to trust me on that. Um, as they say, when you get older, your arms shrink. Anyway, um, and another uh, goal of SEND is in training. And we're very interested in training the next generation. And to accommodate this, there's been a whole number of exchanges. One of them is a vaccine exchange with Novartis in Siena. And two of the students who are here today have worked for six months at Berkeley. And we're sending a couple students over there to work on basic vaccine research as well. And there's a consortium of 10 investigators from, who work on mycobacterium tuberculosis who have gone to India. And the next year, we're meeting in South Africa. And it's just been a fantastic sw ups groundswell of, of, of interest in this area. And so we're glad you can attend today. And this year, we're going to start out with Julie Gerberding. And we've asked her former faculty mentor in the School of Public Health um, advisor, um, Art Reingold, to introduce her. So Ryan, uh, Ryan Art. <laughs> OK. Uh, good morning. That's a tough act to follow, Dan, but I'll try. Uh, I didn't actually know I was introducing Julie until about two minutes ago. Um, so I'll have to make this up. But fortunately, I've known Julie long enough that that won't be difficult. I'm going to skip over the uh, various academic institutions she's uh, graced with her presence, uh, uh, because I think all of that's available to anyone who would like to look at her CV. Uh, one of the, should I use this? Is this uh, OK. One of the uh, joys of uh, working at Berkeley, uh, and I've now been here 25 years, uh, is to get to work with extraordinary students. 
uh, and then uh, once they leave to watch them go on to stellar careers. And Julie is certainly a wonderful example of that. When Julie came here uh, to do the Masters of Public Health and Epidemiology, uh, she was already on the faculty at UCSF and arguably the world's leading expert on prevention of transmission of HIV among healthcare workers. Uh, but uh, in her wisdom, she decided it'd be good to get a little formal training in epidemiology, and she came and spent a year here. Uh, like many students, she got good grades. I would say she stood out uh, more for her wardrobe, uh, because at the time, she was already much better dressed than the average student uh, here at Berkeley. Um, but um, it was uh, quite wonderful uh, to see her then go back to UCSF and expand her research uh, but then to be whisked away uh, a short time later to CDC uh, to head up initially what used to be called the hospital infections branch, but then was given a much longer and fancier name, but the part of CDC that deals with uh, healthcare associated infections and their prevention. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, she quickly rose uh, through the ladder there, uh, on the ladder there, and um, the, the, uh, it was, became apparent, uh, particularly in the days after 9-11, that Julie had a great deal uh, to contribute, and she was made the director of CDC. Uh, and uh, I would say had to run it under some of the most trying circumstances uh, in, in terms of dealing with uh, smallpox vaccine and anthrax and a variety of other things. Uh, so um, uh, clearly a challenging time, which she dealt with uh, extraordinarily well. Um, and now, uh, however, she's gone on to a different job as the president of Merck Vaccines. Uh, and when I checked in with her by email about a few months after she had moved from CDC to Merck, uh, she sent me an email saying, well, you know, it's actually not that different from CDC. Everybody here just wants to get vaccines to kids who need them uh, and to make the world a better place. So uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, Julie is going to expand on that uh, when she tells us about the work that she and Merck are doing. And Julie, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you. It's like the pinning ceremony. Thank you. I am really honored to be here. This is an incredibly erudite audience. And um, if someone had told me in 1990 when I was graduating from the School of Public Health that I would, well, if they told me I was going to go to become the director of the CDC, I would have thought they were nuts. Um, if they had told me that I would be working for a pharmaceutical company, I would have been even more shocked. Um, but actually, to have an invitation to come and speak to the, the scientists in this organization is probably the most shocking thing of all to me. Um, if there's one theme that's united my career um, since I started out in 1981 as an intern at UCSF, is, is, it's been HIV. And I, I'm pleased that the theme of this year's meeting uh, is, includes HIV as one of the continuous um, and unsolved problems of our um, recent decades, but it, it is an area that capt captivated my attention from the very beginning when I was first taking care of the people with this mysterious disease that we couldn't identify. When I was an intern, there would be days when we would be up all night doing fever workups, getting covered with blood, and not understanding why all these men were in the hospital with all of these opportunistic infections. Um, most people at the time thought this had something to do with drug abuse, some exogenous drug that people were taking to enhance their sexual ple pleasure, apparently influencing their immune system and making them vulnerable to infections and cancers. And the infectious disease community at that time was very slow to recognize that this could have been an infectious etiology because the concept of an emerging infectious disease really wasn't something that we talked about then. We were living in the era when we thought all the infections were going away, that vaccines and antibiotics were going to solve the problem. So our own internal mindset, our lack of um, connectivity on a global basis, but also our lack of connectivity across our disciplines and our perspectives really interfered with our ability to recognize very early that this was, in fact, a new infectious disease. I'm not sure we would be further down the path toward prevention and cure um, had we recognized the etiology earlier, but it certainly was a very important aspect of my background because it taught me how important it was to not be dogmatic and to have a humility and an open mind when you look at uh, new problems that you don't understand, but also how incredibly important it is that we connect and work across our disciplines and across our boundaries to find solutions, ask the right questions, and move the agenda forward. So here I am um, representing Merck today, 
And I, um, I have to admit to you, I've given a lot of talks since I joined Merck a few months ago, but this is the first time I've ever given a talk about something that Merck is doing. So um, I'm going to acknowledge right up from the front, none of this is my work. I had nothing to do with any of the things I'm talking about, and I'm not here to tell you that Merck is great or that our products are great or that our science is great. I'm here to try to lay out what goes on in the mind of a pharmaceutical company when they are trying to decide how to go about making a contribution or tackling a, a big problem like HIV and why it's hard and why it takes such a long time and why it's so important that we enhance our partnerships with people in academia um, in other business environments and clearly that we connect on a global basis. So just some uh, level setting here um, to be reminded of the scope of the problem that we're now dealing with. Um, somewhere between 33 and 35 million people globally living with HIV, um, really all over the world, but of course Africa is the hardest hit. And then the incredible good news about access to antiviral treatments that has escalated significantly so that now almost five and a half million people are receiving antivirals, but five and a half is a pretty small fraction of 33 million. And as we learn more about the science of treatment, we recognize that most people need to be on antiviral therapy. So we are in a very difficult situation where our treatment is not fast enough to um, really have the kind of global health impact and these data from the UN really are the most ominous picture because they illustrate in the orange line the number of people projected to die from HIV. So it's still in the millions of people. Um, the green line are the number of people who are newly infected. And that green line is not going south. It continues to go north in part because we don't have effective prevention. Um, even treatment, while it can attenuate transmissibility, is not uh, effective enough so far to really bend that curve. And the uh, number of pe people in the population at risk for transmission is obviously going up as treatments are more and more successful. So we cannot treat our way out of this problem, no matter how much access to affordable antivirals we can create. And we've got to find other prevention modalities, and that's um, really why vaccine continues to um, to be important. This IOM report came out a couple weeks ago, and I, I think it's, it's a really key um, report because it defines the way ahead, mostly from a US um, donor country perspective in terms of what we should be doing, but it really emphasizes this key concept of sharing. And, and again, I think it's ironic that I'm here with this group where you're all about consilient um, jumping across your disciplines, but the sharing and, and collaboration that we need going forward is thematically really the only way to approach problems that are as complicated and as difficult as this problem is. So let me just um, start a little bit with the Merck story, which for vaccines started back in 1985 with some very basic science. and. Um, cutting through a lot of um, work that led up to the corporate commitment to begin a vaccine initiative for HIV was a culture at Merck that was all about vaccines. Some of you may have heard of Maurice Hillman, who is a man who discovered most of the antigens that are used for the childhood immunizations of today. Um, it was back in the days where uh, you know, his daughter got mumps. There was no vaccine for mumps. She was very, very ill. So he swabbed her throat, took the uh, virus sample to the lab, passed it a few times, attenuated it, and then went out and injected it into uh, other children to demonstrate that it was an efficacious vaccine for mumps. And that very strain, named after his daughter, Geraldine, is still the mumps strain that we use today all over the world to help um, prevent mumps disease. So Maurice was part of the Merck Vaccine Research Group, really the backbone of the group for decades. And because he was still at Merck when HIV emerged, it really wasn't a question about should the company do something to try to engage. It was just a given that they needed to do that. But that's a big cry from really having the capability and the capacity. Merck uh, made a decision to um, really concentrate on cell-mediated immunity initially. And there are reasons for this, which I won't go into today. But they followed a very careful course of uh, iterative, approaches to defining the right antigens, the right adjuvant, the right vector, um, the right cell system, and so on and so forth. And I'll just walk you through a little of those, again, to illustrate the complexity, the false leads, and how incredibly complicated it is to really do this kind of work. 
So, you know, the first issue, which anyone who's familiar with HIV understands, is the incredible diversity of the strains that we're dealing with. And this is just the uh, amino acid dis uh, diversity in the various clades. These are drawn to scale, so you can see that there's a huge diversity in envelope and NEF genes, less diversity in GAG and PAL genes, and so that's one of the reasons why the um, CMI approaches tried to work on targets that were, of course, conserved across clades. This is another way of illustrating the same point. The colored bars each represent a geographic region of the world, and the height of the bars is proportionate to the percent of respondents in that geographic area against clade B um, gene components. So GAG, NEF, and PAL are the most universally recognized. The RevTAT and envelope genes are much less um, cross-engineered uh, and, and really less likely to be good candidates for immunization. So right off the bat, there was interest in those three targets for CMI. The next question really was how are we going to present this, this antigen or this constellation of antigens to create an immune response, and a number of different vector systems were um, tried, DNA-based, pox virus-based, VEE-based, and of course the adenovirus-based. I learned this morning from Dan that unfortunately they did not look at listeria monocytogenes or we probably would have you know, taken a different path on our immunization strategy. But um, as illustrated here for the GAG gene, um, there, there is um, clear evidence that the adenovirus vector was the most immunogenic, at least in these macaques. So that was part of the foundation for decisions around what vector would go into the early vaccine trials. Also was important to have some conceptual evidence that a CMI approach had a benefit. Um, so in an SIV model, uh, using SIV engineered um, uh, uh, antigen was able to show that in naive animals, the viral set point after um, uh, in infection was relatively high, 10 to the 6, for example. And in the animals that were exposed to the adeno gag SIV complex, the viral set point was much lower and possibly just below the threshold of detection in at least one or two animals. So that was, you know, soft evidence, animal model, different virus, but at least some suggestion that an effective immunogen could lower the viral um, set point or the, the level of viremia post immunization. Um, other uh, interest in the DNA approach um, was checked out with a prime boost in humans just to make sure that we weren't missing an opportunity here. And there was weak immunogenic activity from this particular vector, but not something that alone you would go into a clinical trial with. You know, response rates that are less than 40% or less than 50% across the board compared to the responses against the adenovirus vectors, which were still not 100%, but quite a bit better than a simple prime boost model than the DNA. And they did look, I'm not sure I brought the slide, but they did look um, at the combination of DNA and adenovirus vectors together, and there was no synergy or no benefit from using them together compared to either one alone. So the decision was made based on these data. Um, to look at adeno more seriously. But of course, since adenovirus infection is fairly ubiquitous, the concern was that people with pre-existing adeno antibodies would not respond to the vaccine because it would be uh, aborted before their immune system saw the HIV antigens. And there was evidence of that. This is a complicated slide, but the point is that if with low um, dose exposure to the antigen, there is a decrease, the line goes down in people with higher antibody, pre-existing antibody titers. So for example, in the first panel, the line uh, to the right hand, lower right hand side are the uh, individual vaccinees who had high titers of pre-existing adenoantibody and really showed lower responses to the GAG gene when they were exposed. Compare that to the panel in the lower right-hand corner here, which is people who were stratified in the same way but were exposed to much higher levels of the adenovirus antigen complex. So you could overcome the resistance to or the failure of responsivity in the seropositive adeno uh, vaccinees by giving them a higher dose of the vaccine. So that said something about overcoming uh, the innate um, immunity to adenovirus, and for that reason, again, the decision was made to go forward with that, um, that kind of a vector. So here's Merck, um, got a candidate or a set of candidates, um, have a vector they think is legitimate, has been tested for safety in humans, 
um, really making the step after phase one and phase two data to go into a phase three trial. Um, now this was, it was a clinical efficacy trial, but I think, at least in retrospect, if you ask the scientists at Merck what they thought the probability of success for this trial actually showing uh, effective immunity against HIV, I'm sure they would have said the probability of success was less than 25%, and some people secretly have told me they thought it was less than 10%, but they felt that it was progress and that they needed to make the financial commitment to go ahead. And they did this in collaboration with the NIAID, so it wasn't Merck alone, but um, it was an extremely expensive undertaking and, you know, really high risk considering the um, possibility that something could go wrong for the patients and the environment being fairly contentious and difficult at that point in time. Um, it wasn't easy to convince the bill payers in the corporate milieu that this was a wise use of the investment, and yet, um, in part because of the cultural commitment and tradition at Merck, and in part because the science really said, this, this looks good enough to try, it's the best thing out there right now, I think we have a responsibility to move ahead, um, they gave it a try. So um, they based this, as I, I've said, there were actually two studies, one um, in America and one in South Africa that were started with this Gagpalnef ad adenovirus um, con cognate and a placebo-controlled study design. They included people who had higher pre-existing titers against adenovirus in the study because from a practical standpoint, that was going to be important if such a vaccine was ever going to actually come into any kind of use. Um, we wanted to test it in the population that would be benefiting from it, which would have included people who had adeno immunity. And for the reasons that I've just outlined, um, the feeling was that this was a good enough uh, to go forward. So the hypothesis in the study was basically twofold, two endpoints. One was that you would prevent infection, that the people exposed to the vaccine would have a lower infection rate. So, uh, men who have sex with men in the U.S. and a more heterosexual population in Africa, and or that the set point after infection would be lower among the people who were receiving the vaccine compared to the controls. Now, this study got started. I was at CDC at the time. We were, we were more optimistic probably than Merck was, all of the reasons I just laid out, and, and hopeful. Hope is a really important modifier of optimism. So we... We, we just wanted it to happen so badly that I think our expectations were pretty high that this was going to be a potentially positive um, approach to immunization. And I'll never forget the day in my office when I got this emergency call from Mark Feinberg. Many of you know Mark. He's an outstanding immunologist. He works on our team at Merck. Mark called me then in his role as kind of being the scientific liaison for the STEP study, and he was trembling. You could hear it in his voice as he had to tell me that the next day they were going to announce that the Data Safety Monitoring Board um, said we had to stop the study for failure. And so um, futility was declared um, by the Data Safety Monitoring Board. The trend in the study at the interim analysis favored the placebo over the vaccine, meaning not only did the vaccine not work, but it looked worse than placebo, suggesting some infection enhancement, and that this study was stopped, and then ultimately, of course, the African study was stopped as well. So um, that was devastating news across the whole HIV community, and it was um, particularly problematic inside of Merck because we had invested a lot in the clinical research that I summarized very quickly, but obviously is thousands of person hours of effort and collaborations across the wide swath of the academic environment. But if you put yourself in the position of a pharmaceutical company who might have a vaccine that works, what's the next thing that would happen? The next thing that would happen is there would be an instantaneous demand for the product because every day that it took you to produce it and manufacture it would be a day that more and more people were getting infected and dying. So Merck actually made the commitment to be able to produce the vaccine at the end of the trial if the data showed that it was efficacious. And so they invested in production. They, they had contracts and got people on board to be able to convert the bioprocessing used for the clinical studies to scale up and really begin to produce the vaccine. So in retrospect, when all the math is done, um, most people think that the cost to get to this point in HIV vaccine development to the company was a billion dollars. 
because that's the money that they spend kind of on a cumulative basis going forward. A billion is, <laughs> even for pharma, that's a really lot of money. And so um, to have to pull the vaccine for no benefit at that point in time sent shock throughout all of pharma because all the other companies knew what the investment must have been and, and how expensive it was. So this was more than just the disappointment from a human health perspective. It was the fear that this would decrease people's interest and willingness to place bets and take risks and move the field of vaccine research forward. And ultimately, a much stronger cry to the government for investing more in supporting this kind of work to create a broader swath of collaborations and capacity to get to a vaccine. So just to make sure that you're um, convinced <laughs> with this bad news, these are the study data in terms of the um, modified intention to treat analysis. And you can see that there's clearly a difference between uh, the infection rate in the uh, vaccinees compared to the placebo, how much higher infection rates. Um, and that seemed to hold up across the spectrum of pre-existing adenovirus antibody. The people who had the highest adenovirus antibodies may have had the un highest infection rate, although the numbers are really too small to draw comparisons. Whereas the people with very low adenovirus antibody levels, um, there was less evidence of immune enhancement in those people. Um, the endpoint obviously wasn't met in terms of infection, but the viral load endpoint was not reached either. The vaccinated people and the unvaccinated people basically had similar set points when they got HIV infection. So there's really no benefit at all. Um, however, interestingly enough, the virus vaccine was immunogenic. Um, for the people with lower adenovirus titers, it was as immunogenic in the clinical study as it had been in the phase one and phase two trials going forward. And for the people with higher um, levels of adenovirus immunity, um, it was also immunogenic, although probably not quite as good as it had been in the clinical studies. So there may be you know, important information here about the preexisting immunity to the vector, but that isn't the whole story. Of course, this cohort has been followed now for a much longer period of time, and the difference between vaccinees and placebo persisted. So even years out from immunization, people who were vaccinated still had a higher chance of infection than the people who were not receiving the active product. When this was looked at um, by stratified risk, including circumcision, because the circumcision data are, are newer, um, and other um, behavioral risk factors, um, there does seem to be a difference between uncircumcised adenovirus vector negative men in the study and everyone else. So uncircumcised men in the study were primarily getting infected through insertive uh, intercourse, and potentially this is telling us something about a difference between an injectable exposure to an antigen and a mucosal exposure to an antigen and a lot more um, needs to be done. But well, one of the take homes here is that we really don't understand the mechanism of cell-mediated immunity. And there's so much more to learn about the immunobiology of this virus that um, there were more surprises than answers. So the conclusion of all this was that vaccines had a higher infection rate and that um, the baseline adenovirus negativity and, un and lack of circumcision may have um, attenuated the enhancement, but um, it was difficult to say for sure because the study had been unblinded and there may have been other cohort effects accounting for those differences. So uh, if you were in a pharmaceutical company facing this kind of dilemma, what would you do? You know, not likely to be able to go forward and request another billion dollars to try something else. Um, you have to really think about um, what are your options at this point and you know, is the premise of cell-mediated immunity wrong? Was Merck's approach wrong? Well, obviously it was because it didn't work. Um, but what do you do next? Well, Peter Kim, who heads uh, the vaccine research at Merck, is a really, really smart guy. Um, and he had been working on neutralizing antibodies for a long time. So it, while the CMI program was going forward, there was still a lot of bench work going on about humoral immune approaches to the vaccine. They didn't put all their bets in one bucket, and there were other um, activities going on. And there's a lot of interest in neutralizing antibodies, since that's the common way we protect ourselves against many pathogens. So Merck came to conclude that, you know, ultimately probably takes both components of the immune system, of the active immune system, to achieve protection. 
and that many of these broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies were giving hints about what epitopes might be especially important for neutralization. Um, and some of these in passive immune studies in animals had looked to be um, protective or at least partially protective and that some of these monoclonal antibodies really do recognize pretty highly conserved epitopes across the clades of virus. So there's hope for a neutralizing antibody approach just based on some phenomenologic perspectives. And um, I, I will just show you that a lot of work has gone on at Merck and elsewhere probably here um, looking at these different epitopes um, and most of them did not pan out to actually achieve broadly neutralizing approaches. The V3 loop vaccines so far have um, you can get some neutralizing activity, but not broad, or you don't get any neutralizing activity, or you don't get any neutralizing activity against the strain that you're using for the exposure, and so on and so forth. So the V3 loop approaches, at least in our hands, did not look exciting. The CDC, CD4 binding monoclonals have not um, turned out to elicit neutralizing responses. Um, some other epitopes um, can give good, strong uh, antibody response, but again, not, not neutralizing and not really targeting um, the, the appropriate antigen. So this led um, Peter and his colleagues to really focus in on the fusion epitopes, the unique um, components that are necessary for virus entry into cells, and this schematic kind of describes this um, process of virus entry in a very cartoon-like manner where you have the cell membrane and the virus and the GP120, GP41 complex moving toward the um, target cell and then this hairpin-like conformation that occurs where you have this intermediate, very transient fusion complex that temporarily displays certain antigens that otherwise you would never see or your immune system would never see. But they're so transient that they don't naturally seem to elicit an immune response in most people. So the idea here is could those antigens that are just there at the moment of hairpin um, production really be uh, a target for immunity? I, just to show us this in a little bit, a bit a closer detail, and the proof of concept here really was in small molecules, where there are small molecules that intercalate in this fusion complex and can attenuate um, fusion. So there was at least reason to believe that if you interfered with this process, you could attenuate infection and viremia um, from analogy to the uh, more pill-like approach. And again, just um, that, the central question here being if you could target antibodies at very specific epitopes, hidden epitopes in here, that perhaps you could interfere with um, the step of uh, HIV transmission. And you know, there's lots of papers and lots of work going on at Merck and elsewhere in this regard, so I'm not going to detail all of that science. I did actually read it in preparation for this. Please don't ask me any questions. Uh, I do know how to relay your questions to the people who can answer them. But I think what's really interesting about this approach is that you had, you know, we, you can't use the native um, uh, proteins because they're so transient. So you have to mimic them. You have to create little surrogate peptides that have the same properties as the epitope you're looking at, but are stable enough to be used as antigens to elicit immune response. And that's a really complex chemistry, as many of you would know. Um, some of that work was done with collaborators in other parts of the world because it's so technically difficult to do this. But using an iterative process, um, the approach that Merck has been taking is to create these um, little epitopes, stabilize them um, with zinc and sulfide bonding and so forth, and um, attach different moieties that allow them to be stable enough and similar enough to the fusion complex to hopefully create some neutralization effect. And um, to continue to cycle through this, um, I think it would be fair to say that what's been published so far suggests that this approach can work. Um, in guinea pigs, there is good cross protection against tier one strains of virus. There has not been cross protection against uh, tier two virus strains, so there's certainly not a vaccine candidate yet. But working on how to augment um, the expression of the IgG antibody and how to detect the neutralization activity are areas that are under active pursuit right now, as well as ongoing efforts to continue to refine and improve uh, this N-heptad um, complex. So uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of work. And again, just 
when you go through and think about what it takes to do each one of these steps and the incredible brain power, the incredible collaboration, and the incredible multidisciplinary um, perspective that has to come into this. It, it really does take a, a broad team of people to be able to get anywhere in this regard. So uh, where we are as a company right now with this particular approach is to say that we think there's reason to continue to pursue this at the bench level. We have nothing that makes sense for a clinical study at this point in time. Um, we've got some good reasons to think that this um, is targeting the right area of the fusion complex to get a neutralizing-like activity, and that there may be other epitopes there yet to be discovered or yet to be talked about that will augment the utility of this particular um, fusion approach. This has all been going on, and then, of course, the hot news in the last year is about the really broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been discovered through a couple different approaches in a couple of patients. Um, these are obviously extremely rare antibodies, but they have the property of not only um, addressing a large and geographic and clade distribution of viral strains, but also with very potent um, activity. So they're not only broad, they're strong neutralizing antibodies. And they're very exciting because if you could figure out exactly what they're targeting and then make a mimetic of that, then potentially you would have a broadly neutralizing antibody that was very strong. That's obviously what we would like to have. So there's a lot of interest in these. And this is kind of um, the challenge here is what's the epitope? Um, because these, these antibodies aren't brand new. They're very matured antibodies that have a lot of affinity maturation. They're not, they have high mutation rates. They're not the kind of antibodies that you would normally produce early on infection. They're discovered in people who've had chronic infections and have had many, 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 many cycles of uh, immune maturation going on. So it's exciting, but we're a long way from having uh, antigen um, for use as an immunogen, but clearly an area that is very exciting uh, across the entire IAVI community and, and one that hopefully will lead to faster approaches for neutralization. And we think there's some reasons to be, um, to be optimistic about this approach because there is a transmission barrier of all the uh, clonotypes of virus that an individual may have circulating. Only a very small proportion of them can be successfully transmitted to someone else. So there is a target group of virus um, types that might be more amenable to this particular broad antigen approach. No evidence of that, but it, it seems like it would be a place to go in terms of looking. And then in the animal models, using monoclonals and other means of passive immunization actually can achieve protection against simian virus challenge at much lower concentrations of antibody, neutralizing antibody than was previously thought. So a little bit of a hint that mm, maybe this would be a preventive approach. And so lots of, lots of reason to, to move forward in that regard. Well, as I said, I'm, I have done none of this work myself. I'm still learning about the incredible um, science that's going on inside the company and across the partnership cascade. But there are many, many other people who have been working on similar things, many other companies, many other academicians and scientists around the world. And it would be unfair not to at least acknowledge um, the most exciting thing that's happened recently was the Thai trial and the partial efficacy that was observed there in this community-based cohort of people stratified for various levels of risk. This study looked at trying to elicit both CMI and humoral immunity, as you may know, and it was a prime boost study um, using two different um, antigen approaches and a very intensive immunization schedule following people over time. And the results of the trial showed partial efficacy, which I'll demonstrate, but really not able to find neutralizing antibody in the subjects and very limited CD8 T cell immunity. So again, suggesting that we have a lot to learn about the correlates of protection from the immunologic standpoint. We just simply don't know what we're looking for, um, but we hope we'll find it anyway. Um, the efficacy here um, at the 30-month trial point of 36% in the intention to treat study and 31% in the per protocol study um, popular analysis um, really is the first evidence that any vaccine has been efficacious in the, in the clinical trial. So we wouldn't want to go out and 
claim to people that a 30% effective vaccine is a good thing. Um, even before we had candidates for vaccines, models of how much protection a vaccine would need to provide to offset any recidivism and other prevention strategies at the community level. And you definitely needed to have protection that ex well exceeded 80%. Because any um, decrease in uh, risk behavior or any increase in risk behavior would immediately wipe out any population advantage from the vaccine. So we know we have a high bar with a vaccine approach alone to offset the natural tendency of people to believe they're protected and then not be as careful as they otherwise would be in their sexual behavior. But this approach in Thailand is obviously being expanded um, in two ways. One is diversifying and, and uh, refining the immunogens and the approach to the vaccine study, um, but also um, broadening out into new vectors and new dimensions of looking at it. And these are all very, very expensive things to do. And it's going to take a much bigger global budget to be able to pull this off than we currently have committed on a global basis toward this kind of work. So if you hear cries for more funding for PEPFAR, for antivirals, those cries need to be heeded for the reasons I said at the beginning of the conversation, but there also needs to be a very loud cry for more support for expanding the capacity of the vaccine agenda because this is not affordable for any one entity and it really does need to take a shared, a shared approach. So when you think about um, the overall timeline of the trials that have gone to phase three, um, it's easy to be a little bit disappointed because after all we've been aware of this problem since the early 80s, and we've known about the virus since 85. This is taking a long time. Um, but we did, in 2009, have a study that showed partial protection. So it's proof of concept that a vaccine is still a realistic goal. And those five studies represented here really rest on a foundation of more than 200 antigens that have gone into phase one and two studies to try to find a successful immunogen with the endpoints necessary for protection. And it represents an even bigger um, bottom of the pyramid of uh, foundational fundamental research that is probably still the tip of the iceberg. And, and I think that's the, that's the, you have to have a long view in this business. Uh, we can't give up because it's been hard early on. And if you, if you want to really understand that, go back and read the history of the polio vaccine. And, and really appreciate how incredibly long it took to get to the Sabin and Salk vaccines in the human population. And the setbacks, including um, a trial that looked like it probably enhanced polio virus infection, and then the problems in manufacturing and attenuation that led to the outbreak um, with one of the products. So we have to have that long view, and we have to be really willing to talk about it that way so that people don't get unrealistic expectations about how, um, how come, let's give up, put our money somewhere else, more treatment, more treatment, more treatment, whatever um, the options are on the table. And I, I, I am an optimistic person in my core, so I believe that there is still a lot of opportunity for discovery in this regard, and that you know, in 20 years, we'll look back on these first five trials and say, oh my goodness, what were they thinking? Um, clearly, they should have gone over here, and you know, clearly, we should have been using Listeria. And um, you know, it, it's, it, there's just so much to learn, and it's so important that we find ways to connect the brain power that we have applying to this um, in, in creating new and, and innovative solutions. I would be remiss if I left prevention entirely in the hands of the vaccine. And until we get to an 80 plus percent effective vaccine, we have to accept the importance of a lot of other prevention strategies, including good old counseling and behavioral modification that can work um, in certain cultures and under certain conditions at least can have an attenuating effect. And more recently, the um, immunologic or the um, non-immunologic based protection uh, associated with novel ways of using antivirals, in this case, the Caprice study that showed the tenofovir uh, microbicide approach really was um, as effective as the Thai vaccine trial in protecting women against HIV. And it may be that as we're in this in-between zone, we are going to have to look at that kind of Swiss cheese approach where 
well, here's, here's a slice, here's the vaccine, but it's got some holes in it. Now here's the microbicide, it contributes, but it's got some holes in it too. Um, here's behavioral intervention, that has a lot of holes in it, but when you line them all up, you might end up with a pretty solid prevention barrier. And that's probably the way we have to be satisfied um, as we are today in approaching prevention. But over the long run, we need to keep pushing until we have something that truly is, is as effective as the um, vaccines that we're used to for other conditions. It's a big challenge, but I think it's one that you know, you'll get to, and I hope it happens here. Um, so it would be great to be from the place that made those kinds of discoveries and, and made that kind of um, global contribution. And I go to Africa a lot, I'm sure many of you do, and um, you know, I could tell you many stories about how humbling it is to be in Africa, but I'll just tell you two reasons why I'm at Merck. Um, one was a little girl in Lusaka, which was, it was an orphanage in Lusaka, and, um, all of the parents of these thousands of children had died of HIV. So the children were all, some of them were infected probably, but they hadn't been tested. Anyway, this little girl um, knew that she had HIV. She was probably, I'm guessing, maybe 11 or 10. And it started to rain, and so we were standing in line to dedicate something, and she scooted right in front of me. And she put her head back like this, and she looked at me, and she said, can you take me to America? And I said, why would you want to go to America? And she said, I need drugs. And you know you don't have to look into the eyes of a child too many times before you realize how important this is. Um, the other, the other kind of um, really important moment for me in Africa was just recently after I was at Merck, and you know Merck makes a papillomavirus vaccine that we're trying to globalize, and get out there. And I was in the AIDS clinic in uh, at Macquarie University in the IDI facility, and this is lady waiting for um, care in the clinic and she started to have vaginal bleeding. And it was very significant, vag uncontrollable vaginal bleeding, and they took her off somewhere, and, you know, and they said, what, what's going on with that lady? And they said, she has cervical cancer. You know, and here I am, the president of a vaccine company that makes a cervical vaccine, and you know, we don't have it in Uganda. So these are the things that our science can kind of uh, occupy our attention, but it's the humanity that really is the driver. Thank you. Immunology. <laughs> um, wait for the microphone, but yeah. Um, Thomas? Exactly. I'm sorry, I do have to ask an immunology question <laughs> because we are talking vaccines. So, so one of the questions I had was about how you assess the efficacy of a vaccine. So if you're going to look at, say, viral titers, then that tells you the amount of virus that is present or the amount of RNA that is being made for the virus. But really what affects the patients is loss of CD4 cells. So I was wondering if in your vaccine trials you go all the way to finding out what happens to the patient in terms of their uh, yeah. CD4 T cells and uh, yeah, so that's one. The second thing I was wondering about was how you assess the CD8 T cell response, because the whole thing is predicated on knowing the peptides. Because we don't know the peptide, there might be plenty of CD8 T cells out there, but you won't know that they even exist in the immunized patients. Yeah, I mean, and with respect to your last question, I mean, obviously what's probed for is the response to the antigens that were in the vaccine. So that, you know, that's what, that we look what, where the light is shining for that. But the broader question of what, um, what, you know, what is the appropriate endpoint is, we don't know exactly what is the appropriate endpoint. We make judgments that prevention of infection is, a, is an obvious endpoint and viral set point is a surrogate for a lot of other complex uh, interactions. But one of the difficulties, and you know, inside of Merck, we sort of say the STEP trial did not, was not a, a efficacious, but we learned and are still learning an enormous amount by studying the people in that cohort and trying to tease out what's going on with their immune system. And I think one of the tragedies of the Thai study is that 
you know, it, it, it was a successful trial, but there's so few samples available for sharing across the people who want to be probing these nuances that you're discussing that there just isn't enough material to answer the important questions that you're bringing. And that's something we have to think about as we design future studies is no matter what the outcome of the study is, we've got to use it as a laboratory um, and share those opportunities across the community of scientists more effectively. Might make an issue, um, just, just to give you some data from the STEP trial. Um, one of the things we did not, we learned and we didn't anticipate was the amount of immunodominance that one saw and the narrow breadth that one saw. So if you took the GAG gene, which actually biomet biometric analysis has about 150 nine-mers of potential human uh, HLA peptides. Um, when we looked at epitope mapping, the average person who received the vaccine just made one one um, nine-mer against the entire GAG gene. So when we, and, and essentially, so the median uh, essentially epitope breadth was only three. Now when we did epitope mapping, we actually then found that almost everybody made a unique peptide and they rarely made it to a conserved region of either, of either GAG, pole, or NEF. Um, so one of the things we actually did not understand was this, this issue that uh, we are not, the vaccines, even though you put in the conserved regions of the genes, um, they, the human is not seeing the conserved regions of the genes. And essentially, we're not covering that. And the few people in which we actually got coverage of, an, of the infecting viral strain, we actually did show that we actually did put pressure on the virus and that they actually had a slightly decreased viral load, as if you stopped the virus, you know, transiently at the line and it spin, spun around and continued on. So um, that's, you know, one of the, the issues that, you know, you really don't end up having very good predictive models of this. The non-human primate has many more HLA types uh, than human, and therefore you get much greater breadth um, of T cell based vaccines in the non human primate, and that model has been not been very predictive of, what, of what's going on. So, we're sort of understanding that you need to overcome immunodominance. So, it's not just the vector, it's also the design of the insert. So, now there's a whole series of mosaic, what we're called the mosaic inserts that are designed to increase T cell breadth, and they're starting to go into human clinical trials, and whether they'll fulfill the promise of increasing breadth uh, remains yet to be determined. But um, uh, you know, that's sort of one of the sort of the major, major findings. Um, as far as your first question, the STEP trial was really designed with co-primary endpoints. I mean, really was a viral load analysis. And, um, and again, uh, the patients were followed. They were followed for the CD4 counts and time to CD4 count and time to uh, development of 350. You're not going to, you know, follow them till time to AIDS. I mean, but um, both CD4 and viral load were followed, and there, there was no chronic effect, as I said, for the people who actually made um, an epitope to match their infecting viral strain, there was a transient reduction in acute viral load. So, uh, so um, you mentioned at the beginning there are 30 to 35 million people already now currently infected with HIV, so are there any efforts being made for a therapeutic vaccine, you know, to sort of treat these people who are already infected so they will not progress to uh, overt disease? Yeah, I don't know that anything is in clinical trials right now. I, I'm, I'm sure there isn't anything in a clinical trial, but clearly that, that approach has been looked at. And, and um, there's, you know, for the very reasons that you're talking about, there's reasons to think that there could be a role for that. I'm not familiar with those studies, and Merck is not doing them. Does somebody else know the answer to that question in more detail? Thank you, Julie. I have two questions. They're in the realm of sociology, not immunology. Um, has Merck abandoned um, hope for adenovectors is question one. And question two is Paul Offit's book required reading at Merck vaccines. What was the second question? Is 
is Paul Offit's oh, yeah. book, Vaccinated, <laughs> Required Reading at Work. Absolutely. Um, so the, so the um, I, I wouldn't say that we would abandon anything, but you know, obviously we need to understand um, the relationship between pre-existing immunity and the outcome in that study better. Um, the, some of the products that are in clinical trials are still using adeno vector-based approaches. So you know, there, there, are, there is ongoing work outside of Merck in this area. Um, with respect to Dr. Offit, many of you may know he's a pediatrician at the University of Pennsylvania who is a strong champion of immunization for everything. Um, contributed his science to the development of the rotavirus vaccine um, approach and is a person who's not only written a book that details the history of vaccines, including Dr. Hilleman, and the whole story about how many of our contemporary vaccines came into being, but more recently has been really concentrating on um, the benefit of vaccines at the societal level and what we need to be doing to dissuade people who see them primarily as sources of risk and have not appreciated the incredible benefit that they bring. He's an incredibly courageous man. He speaks out on behalf of immunization at great personal risk, and um, he's one of our heroes. So I would encourage everyone to read his books. Um, just one last question on your um, failed study. How, how long will Merck invest in continuing to follow those 3,800 patients? I don't know the answer to that. I can get back to you on that, but I do know that you know we're we're still looking at samples. We're still trying to learn as we go. So I think in line of the question about therapeutic vaccines, it would take a long time to follow that cohort to know if that vaccine had any potential therapeutic effect in terms of delayed of progression to AIDS. And I just I think it's a valuable cohort to continue to follow. And if Merck were to decide to drop it, I think someone else might want to look at picking up funding to follow those patients. Yeah, so. I don't think we're seeing any signs of that at the moment, but um, yeah, it's too soon to say for sure. Um, the, you know, it is hard. I mean, I, I, to be completely candid, it's hard to know what to do when you're coming out of a situation like this and you're trying to be realistic about what a company can contribute. But, you know, Peter is obviously still continuing basic research in HIV, Peter and, and the group at Merck, and it's a high priority. This isn't just something we're dabbling in on the side, so we still feel a responsibility and a commitment. Um, but there are also new ways of thinking about partnerships, and the IAVI mechanism is an area that Merck continues to be very involved in, but there are more um, corporate academic partnerships that need to be explored. And I, I think ultimately the model that was used for a different uh, a neurologic chronic disease of some pre-competitive collaboration among pharmaceutical companies is also a model that would make sense here in addition to what Mr. Gates and the Grand Challenges and, and the Gates Foundation are trying to do. So um, not only are we learning the really complexities of the virus and the immune system, themselves, but we're also really experimenting and learning what is the best way in this modern age to tackle a problem as hard as this one, to move the money when everyone is having to pull back on their own individual contributions. How do you move the money or leverage it in ways where you can get more, more, more scientific value, more human value for the investments that you make? So if, you know, we're open to ideas for that kind of partnership and collaboration. And just giving you more money isn't exactly the way it will work, but. <laughs> we'll take it. Um, I'd like to complete this discussion with Dr. Yep. Corey, who. But just for clarity, just a factual clarity. We, we love the collaboration with Merck. The STEP study was a, a true collaboration, but you know, 75% of it was paid by the um, NIAID and the HVTN and 25% by Merck until the, um, until the uh, first analysis, at which point in time, um, we rolled the patients over into a follow-up study called HVTN 504, which the which the the HVTN supported. The, so the the follow-up studies uh, these um, we did followed everybody in the cohort for four years. Everybody who's HIV infected in an HVTN study gets followed forever uh, in a follow-up study. And so you know there are always selection biases as you winnow, winnow that down. But um, you know the patients the subjects are are still being followed. And we're essentially followed all of the entire cohort, um, both in U.S. and South Africa, for four years. Okay, well, that was fantastic. Let's thank Dr.